There he is, that boy. What's, up, What's going on, Josh? Good to see you, man. Long time, bro. Long time. What's going on? Welcome back to the sit down. It is now episode, I think this is 20. It's been a little while, but we got a very, very special guest here. This is my good friend, Josh, actually. How's it going? Haven't seen my man, Josh, since 2017. We actually went to school together for PTA school. Um, and he made, not for me, but he made the trip down to see his wife's family in Orlando. And then uh, he actually reached out and he wanted to come on the show. And, and here we are. So, Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And it's, it's funny because we were joking right off camera about how we talked about so much good stuff. Yeah. And we wish we had it on camera, but uh, hopefully we can replicate some of it. That was kind of in kind of what Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But first of all, bro, let's start, man. Congratulations on being a father. Thank you. I appreciate it. Congratulations. Yeah. That's, it's so crazy, you know, when you see, when you don't see people for a long time. Yeah. You should see change in somebody, right? But it's like, especially something like that, it, that's a wild thing. It is, but it's, uh, it's honestly... The, like the greatest thing ever. Uh, to be able to kind of shape and mold somebody that can't do anything for themselves, and right. you, you now are the sole provider for them uh, to make sure that they don't hurt themselves or anything like that. And it's, it's just great to be able to watch her, her uh, daughter watch her grow uh, from not being able to do anything to now walking around saying dada. That's crazy. It's crazy. Like even like, <laughs> Just, we've been down here for a couple weeks in the Orlando area. She started out like barely walking and now she's like almost running around the house, making turns, carrying stuff. It's, it's crazy. You know, you know what they say, it's once you have a kid, that's, that's a constant clock, a reminder of how oh, yeah. old you're getting. Oh yeah. So good luck. I, I, I need it. She keeps me on my toes. Hey, that's good though. That's good. So it was, so let's talk about, cause I want to kind of go back, right? Cause we had sort of talked about, you know, your family and the whole kind of the whole COVID situation, yeah. right? Cause you had it. Obviously, there's always people who have it worse. There's always people yeah. who have it better. But your situation was very unique, yeah. you know, in the sense of working and then in a five-day period of time, being out of work, COVID hitting hard, yeah. having a baby on the way in three months, yeah. moving back home shortly after that. So yeah. kind of dive into that a little bit, sort of how that yeah. all sort of unfolded. So, so, so I guess it kind of starts with uh, being at work, seeing patients, you know. Right. They follow the news more than I do. They keep me up to date on what's going around, on around the world. And there's rumblings of people saying like, hey, have you heard about this COVID or, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Da, 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 da. And I was like, you know, I was kind of under the impression, oh, you know, it's just going to be something. You know, there's always something that gets out. Always. It's, maybe it's a little bit worse than what it is. But then, then it got where it's like, man, this could be pretty serious. Right. Which, you know, it turned out to be pretty serious. And, um... So, right before everything started shutting down, my wife and I had a trip already planned. We were going to fly up, we were going to a concert on uh, Friday night, and then driving over to my hometown, a couple hour drive, uh, for a baby shower for my mm -hmm. now daughter. And then we are going to come back, and so we get on the flight, and, or, or we go to the airport, and all of a sudden I get these texts like, hey, the basketball tournaments are shutting down, I think, I was like, oh, geez. I remember that. Yeah, and I was like, I was like, well, well, hopefully, in my own selfish way, I was like, well, this is a concert I really want to see. <laughs> hopefully, this is still going on. And um, so I'm like, I keep checking, like, every 10 minutes, and they keep posting, like, oh, yeah, the, 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 it was still, the, still going on. We haven't heard anything from the um, Coliseum, where it's going to be at, da, 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 da. And uh, we get on the tarmac, and before I put my phone into airplane mode, I check it one more time, it says the concert was now canceled. So I was like, mm. well... We're going up anyway. We right. Have, we have, at least we'll see friends for a night, mm -hmm. and then we'll drive over and we'll have a, a baby shower and, and drive back, and then fly back down here. And uh, I get back down. We so we go through the whole thing. Everything was fine. Everyone was a little cautious though, because right. uh, we had a gathering of probably about 15, 20 people, and so everyone was kind of like, "What's going on?" And so that was kind of my first inclination, where you know. This may be out here. Weird. Right. It's not like it was mainly family. There was a few friends there too, and it was just it was a kind of a slightly different vibe than mm. what, it, what it would normally be. So we get back on the plane, we fly back down, go into work on Monday, and you know, they send out a couple emails with it. We have kind of new policies. You know, make sure you thoroughly clean everything. Clean it in front of the patients yep. so that way they know it's clean. Uh, kind of keep distance if you can. I, I obviously, you have to do hands-on work and stuff. That that is what it is, but. 
kind of, you know, just be respectful of people. This is kind of, everything's starting to just kind of shut down. We're still up and running and still essential. So right. we're still going. Um, my wife had gotten a little call for sniffles, I brought it back. And she, right. so she kind of texted me and was like, hey, I have the sniffles or, and a call going to get checked out. So I immediately let my uh, manager at the clinic that I was at know, and they were, she reached out to her hires up and they're like, just don't do any hands on, kind of keep the short sure. distance, kind of oversee your patients and whatnot. So we, we did that for the day. And um, by that time, my, this was kind of before the testing was going on. Right. My wife, I mean, they were doing testings, but it was like, it was limited. Bad. You had to have, had to have symptoms yep. and you had to have the time set. So my manager was like, hey, what do you think about trying to sign up for a test? And I looked and I was like, well, the next thing's not until like three weeks from now. I think I can sign up for it, but by that time, I'm not going to help you yeah. much, right? Um, so my wife went to the doctor, a walk-in clinic, and they were like, oh, no, you're good. Like, it's not, we don't think it's COVID. And it turned out not to be, which is good. Yeah, definitely. But they were like, that day when I left, Tuesday was a, is a short day where I was working. And so they were like, just stay home today. We'll kind of figure it out. And so Tuesday goes, we already were losing a lot of patients right. because the clientele I was working with was a lot older patients. And so they weren't coming in, rightfully so. They were worried about, they, you know, if you were kind of looking into the, like Italy and other areas, it, it did seem to kind of already be hitting older oh, people. Yeah. So they were, all my old patients were like scared. They were all canceling, you know, you would take the call and you say, hey, I don't blame you. Like, yeah. look, you gotta look out for yourself first. It's, you know. We can always figure out something else if you need, and it was like, I'll send you, make sure your home exercise program is up to date so that way you can keep doing it and then we'll see you when you're ready to come back. See you, yeah, exactly. You know, I was thinking it was going to be, we'll see you next week. You, you were exactly, me too. I think we and all so, did. Yeah, and so Wednesday comes along, it was either Wednesday or Thursday. I didn't go back into work from that Monday when they, kind of, after that Monday, they were like, <laughs> hey, just hang home. We don't have any patients, you know. Your wife had the sniffles, just make sure nothing's going on right, with you too, and then right. come back and we'll see you like starting next week. Wednesday or Thursday, I get a call that the company decided they're going to kind of cut some of the staff, let them go, let them get on to unemployment, and then once everything's over, we'll kind of look to hire people back. Right. Home. Which, don't blame the company, you got to, I mean, you got to make sure money coming in is more than money, money going, going out, because right. if not, the company doesn't doesn't succeed, and if the company doesn't succeed, then everyone's out of a job. Exactly. So, uh, no ill will towards it. It's, I mean, it's how businesses run, and that was early on in the um, in the pandemic before really PPP loans were like the thing that everyone was trying to do. So, don't blame it, you know, it is what it is, and so ever since then, I've kind of been back at home, and then had a baby on the way three months after that, baby born beginning of July, and moved in August. Now, how did you how did you navigate that? Right, that that must have been a very it was turbulent uh, kind of time there, right? Yeah, it was interesting because I no longer had a paycheck, and at the beginning of COVID, all the people getting on unemployment, like they said they were gonna get you unemployment, but it took forever everything to right. process. So it was like three or four weeks without. It was like almost a month before I even got any, like a month with no paycheck. Um, you know, luckily my wife was still working. And I had, you know, enough money where we were able to pay rent and make sure everything was good. And then I'm lucky enough to also have a good support system in my parents where they're pretty well financially that if something happened, I could take a loan from them and not worry, you know. So it was, you know, some people, would, like you said, had easier, harder. I never, I never was really super scared about it because it was like, I knew I was lucky enough to have kind of a fallback where if I needed sure. a loan, I had a place I could go to, to get some money if need be. So, you know, it was scary. It's, a, it's an interesting situation. Yeah, it's, it is. It's still super scary because, you, you know, you don't have a job. So, yeah. And then you, on top of that, you, you know, you're not providing anything to right. family. So it's kind of, you start to go through, well, almost not like a depression. I mean, some people go through depression. Sure. But I, Luckily, wasn't depressed, but it, you know, you do lose a little bit of your kind of Which worth as a person yeah, and, yeah. and stuff because now no longer do I go in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to a job. I lose connection with people because you don't, mm -hmm. you don't have the interaction. Yep. So, 
So I only, the only interaction I was getting for the past 15 months would be family, my wife, and I'm now 11 month old. Right. So it's different, but it was, it's, it's good. I, you know, you gotta take the, the silver lining out of everything. Absolutely. I got to spend a lot of time with my daughter that I would never have gotten to if not, and for that I'm incredibly grateful. So the pandemic, rough, but if you choose, if you find the good stuff out of it, you can make it through. And so. that's, you know, and that's kind of with anything in life, yeah. right? That there's always a benefit and a power to sort of finding that silver lining in any situation because there always is one, right? I, I'm really a yeah. believer in that. There's always a positive out of any negative situation, right. any situation, period. Right. And it's like, like you would said, Josh, for you, it's so cool, right? Because we talked about this too. You know, it was such a blessing in disguise that everything had happened the way it did because you were able to see a lot of those fundamental stepping stones that yeah. your daughter was able to take. Exactly that under normal circumstances you would have had to hear about through a story or through yeah. a camera. Yeah. Right? And that's, we had talked about this too, that's one of my biggest goals in life. Yeah. I hope and I pray that when that time comes for me to have a family, I can be present. Yeah. Be present in my son or my daughter's life. Yeah. When they're going through those developmental stages where you took your first step, you said your first word. So, you know, you're so right and, and that's, that's commendable, right? Yeah. Because a lot of people, I believe, really don't have that ability to see the positive in a negative situation yeah. because the positive you actually have to work to find. Right. It doesn't just show up. You know, you actually have to spend time and energy and think, how can I be positive out of this really bad situation? Yeah. You know, and it's like, I can only think about myself about, with COVID, about how that spurred on me to become how to, how to challenge myself in different ways, AKA the podcast, yeah. AKA me hopefully becoming an author, you know, in the next couple months, you know, things of that nature, trying to find that ability, like you had said, to replace that self-worth and to replace that level of confidence and feeling like you're providing in a yeah. different way because jobs come and go, you know, no job is forever, <laughs> you know? So it, it's interesting in that sense. And it's like, let me ask you this, Josh, for you, yeah. what did you do? to sort of get that level of confidence back, to get that that sense of, I don't wanna say worth per se, because yeah. I know you know you're worth something, yeah, but yeah. that sense of almost pride, or yeah. that sense of I accomplished something back again. I think, uh, luckily I don't really deal with like depression and things like right. that, which I think that is, there's a lot of people that when this pandemic happened, I, it's hard, it's gonna be hard for, in the future to quantify the amount yeah. of depression that has occurred from that and people dealing with depression right. and mental stress that has come from just kind of everything shutting down. And it comes in so many different forms. Too, right. You and know? so so luckily I don't deal with that, which right. is I think the first lucky step that I have. But then, you know, I was also lucky that I had a, a daughter that was born. So from that I was able to uh, even though I wasn't providing necessarily income or, or a job, I was able to provide childcare for mm. my daughter. I was able to uh, make sure that she was kind of, not raised, but you know, kind of the way that we wanted to, right. where we were a lot more hands-on instead of just kind of, nothing wrong with sending her to a daycare, which we're gonna have to do eventually, but we were able during these first like formable years, able to kind of shape her and mold her the way right. we wanted to. And, and I was able to, uh, like you said, see things that I wouldn't have normally gotten to see. And so that was very, uh, very happy and very encouraging and made me feel very good. Because I was able to say, this is something that's part of me that's now kind of growing and I'm able to, to really have an imprint on it. And it's gonna last forever, right? Yeah. You know, we had talked about earlier about kind of leaving your mark, right? Yeah. You being able to imprint Obviously, she's so young, but yeah. even, I still believe, you know, imprinting values, imprinting, mm -hmm. you know, certain certain key things in your daughter at such a young age, you know, that that's priceless. Yeah. There's no amount of money you could have made at a job that could exactly. replace that. Exactly. You know, and, and it's funny because we had talked about money, you know, about how. <laughs> well, yeah, we were talking about how it's just old things. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it's so crazy, right? Because it's like, you know, you, you know, being out of work right now, you kind of realized how how elusive you know and how when you're trying to chase a dollar bill it, it's almost like a butterfly right when you try to chase a butterfly it always is going to fly away but the second you stay still and, and you appreciate a situation and you just put your hand out and you leave it there it's going to land right in your hand right. 
and it's like it's so cool to hear that you know you're finding you know that yeah. you know in your daughter right because that's something that's going to be there forever mm -hmm. right and, and money won't right and it's something goes yeah something goes. it absolutely does now now let me ask you this you know where where are you at with 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 physical therapy now you know what's where where are you at the whole thing what's kind of your stance on it? i uh i love the treatment of patients if that was the sole thing, as most physical therapists I know, if that was the first sole thing, only thing, I would never leave that. Right. And I haven't left it yet, but um, it's uh, the way healthcare is going. It's a, I don't know, it's an interesting way of what's going to happen in the future. There's different things that happen, whether or not, you know, we've been talking about the laws that may or may not yeah. pass, where reimbursement rates may change. Even if they don't, I think the way the only way that companies are going to be able to keep maintaining money or making money high is volume. high volume. So you're going to be, your therapists are going to be seeing your patients for your initial evaluations, and then your PTs, A's are going to be seeing multiple, multiple patients, just more and more patients every hour. It's the only way to make sure that they can keep turning profits. Right. And so, but I mean, that's, that's the whole soul, or the whole reason that the company's around is to turn profits, to employ people and to turn profits. Yep. So. If you can't do, if you can't turn a profit, You're like we said, <laughs> nobody, there's going to be nobody working there. Right. So, I don't know, I don't know if that's the way it's going to go. I, I don't see how it doesn't go a different way because right. just reimbursement rates seem to always drop every year. You don't, they, you know, take a couple pennies a year, a couple, you know, and I don't know. So I don't know. I, I'm not turned off by it because I still love the profession. It's a very mm -hmm. much needed profession. I think it's almost undervalued. Yeah, it is. Because still. there's so much that can be done non surgically and things like that. And like what I was doing, I was doing a lot of the stimulus stuff, a lot mm -hmm. of balance things. And so that's something that you, there's no real surgery that no. can, unless it's something like a brain tumor, you know, than that. But like if it's something within the vestibular system, there's no surgery yet that can really fix it or everything that is being done is kind of more experimental type stuff right now. Right. So, who knows how long before that becomes available to anybody who doesn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay out of Exactly. So, <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff that can be done um, non-surgically, and I think I think the value that is added by physical therapy is not really seen, and it just reimbursements keep getting cut and cut and cut. And so I don't. But I love the I love the I love the profession. I'm still have my license. Still right. going to maintain my license. As you should. But, uh, <laughs> But uh, you didn't suffer in school for no reason, yeah, exactly. Right? But it's uh, it's uh, not disheartening, but it's a little different, yeah. You know, and, and we have talked about this too. It's so interesting because I think healthcare is the most stable field mm -hmm. in all of the lines of work, or one of, in my opinion, but it's also the most pliable in, in readily changeable fields that there is as well, right? Because medicine is always evolving. Now, insurance companies are evolving to keep up with that, yeah. and now the people that are employed by these big medical companies are having to change and grow too, yeah. right? And like you had said, it is a little bit concerning in the sense of where does it go in the next two, three years? Where does it go in the next five years? You know, yeah. what is my outlook going to be, right? Because you, the ROI, you know, the return on investment in terms of going to school, you always want that to stay in your favor. Yeah. And I know, at least for me, quality of care is such a big thing when it comes to my line of work. Mm -hmm. I can't work at places where I'm seeing four or five, I've even heard yeah. five people in an hour, which is just, which is crazy. Yeah. And again, no knock in the company. I understand it's a business. Yeah. We all understand that. Nobody, I don't think anybody's ignorant to that fact. But at what point in time does physical therapy become a complete business and you lose the quality of care, which in my opinion as a therapist, being in the field almost five years, is the sole purpose and driving motivating factor between, between people coming back and not. It is. I think, uh, I, I should say a lot of therapy clinics may lose that, but if you, if you can't um, provide one quality uh, care to the patient where they see necessarily improvement or they can see what's going on right they can see that they're getting better and if you don't have a like kind of welcoming clinic you're where you're interacting sure. uh you're not gonna you're, you're gonna go in there because you're not gonna be able to have enough patients that are gonna keep returning 
Um, and then, you know, when we're talking about reimbursement rates, I see the insurance, they employ these people to try to make sure that they can cut costs. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, they have a business too. So their, their goal is to make money and our goal is to make money. Well, not to make money, ours is to help the patients, but the company's goal is to stay afloat. Of and course. Um, it's kind of almost like a bad one yeah. thing. And, and I, so, I, I think the next thing that needs to be done is how can those two coincide? Right. Because there is a way for those two to work together and for both separate businesses to work as one entity and for everybody yeah. to flourish. I think, like you had said, physical therapy is so underutilized and underappreciated. If you really look at it, physical therapy in itself hasn't got the respect it's deserved up until the past 20 years. Yeah. Up until the past 20 years, it was a completely taboo thing. Nobody went to physical therapy. Yeah. And now it's finally starting to get the respect. Why do you think it, it's seven years now to go get your doctorate? Yeah. Why do you think now it, you know, the, the education standards are increasing for PTAs and PTs? That's mm -hmm. not coincidence. Yeah. That's because in order to quantify our level of care, we have to show them a piece of paper to say, yeah, we logged X amount of years, which is so wrong in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, I've known PTAs that are far better than PTs and they've done far less years of school, but I've also seen the other way where I've seen PTs that are far better than PTAs. It has nothing to do with the schooling in my opinion. It all has to do with why you do it. It does, it does that and for me personally, I don't know where the switch came from, but we used to be a country where you did a lot of like internships and uh, almost apprenticeships, right? which I don't, which is fine that we switched from that but i felt like i've learned i learned so much more on job training with any job i've ever had with on job, job training of course than when i was in reading whatever book yes. was because you have nothing to relate it to so uh i think getting away from that now that you know i mean now like you said you get seven years you get a piece of paper and you can go and do a job but mm -hmm. if you take a pta who's worked for three or four years and a new pt like you said or vice versa, new PTA and a, one somebody that's been as a PT for a couple of years. I mean, the knowledge that you learn from hands-on experience far outweighs. You can't replicate it, right? And, and I'm so confident, you know, in our education at South. Yeah. We got a DPT education in in a in a PTA degree, mm -hmm. and I'm confident in saying that I think one of our PTA program is one of the best PTA programs in South Florida, hands down. Yeah. Like I got out of school and I had four or five places trying to hire me and I haven't even taken my, my board exam yet. Yeah. They were already trying to hire me. Hey, we want you just, just pass the boards and then come see us. We're ready. Yeah, there are several places that I know that like try to only hire people out of South Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's not a coincidence. I've met, we won't go into the details, yeah. but I've met people that have gone to other PTA programs that weren't the same. Yeah. And you know, it, it's so great. I'll, I have to tell you a story really quick because I told this to one of my one of my one of my patients that I work with. I'll never forget that one day we I came because we always used to come in early. Uh -huh. Shout out to Andrew. Shout out to obviously Josh, Candy, Mia, uh -huh. Bree, Jen, Dan, John, Dan, Dan, everybody, everybody. Shout out to y'all, man. I hope y'all are doing well. But us three, me uh -huh. and Andrew, you we used to come in at like eight a.m. for like a three p.m. practical. Yeah. So we'd be there all day, and I remember. We went into that little room next to our our, uh -huh. our room, right? And I remember on the board you had compression numbers yeah. and the compression scale and, and what you would use. And I had not studied that at all. Yeah, I don't, I don't know who put that up there. Cause are you talking about like uh, compressions for uh... for like certain millimeters of mercury or pressure? In, yeah, you know, yeah. So like you want compression at, at 80 mmg for yeah. X, Y, or Z. You yeah. want 120 for X, Y, Z, yeah. right? And I remember coming in and seeing that. I think it was probably Andrew. I, I would guess it was Andrew. And it, it was, was the ones that was with the You numbers. very thorough. <laughs> and I remember coming in and, and cramming it into my brain. I go in for my practical. My whole practical was compression. <laughs> there you go. The entire practical. Yeah, I literally passed that practical because of you guys. Yeah, I think one something that happened to me too. Like I, I knew this stuff pretty well except for like one little area I like for some reason I couldn't remember yeah. and like that was something that Lopez hit me with like one of the questions like his standalone question was like what about this and so I just like tried to memorize what was on the board and try to pull the right yeah. number from it I was like I think I got it right and then luckily I did but, yeah, it's, it was I remember yeah. so many I remember sitting outside that room literally biting my nails off being yeah. so nervous and I remember uh I remember hearing a story, this is after we had already graduated. I remember, because my friend Brandon, uh -huh. 
he knows Flo too. He works with me. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. He went to South as well. And he had told me a story about how one of his classmates failed a practical exam because they couldn't do ultrasound for seven minutes straight. <laughs> they physically could couldn't not do, do ultrasound oh for seven minutes straight. And it, it, that's so funny to me because I actually had ultrasound yeah. on one of my practicals. Uh -huh. And I, I still have nightmares about Lopez saying, all right, really good job. Now take a seat, sit down in front of him. A book, 800 pages big, just... All right, tell me about it. Is just like I actually, I actually <laughs> think he's one of the few. I don't. I what? I don't, people probably like him. I would actually really like Lopez. He was, I love him. He yeah. was amazing. He was hard, hard, and he but, right. had very high expectations, and and that's why I love that program so right. much, right? Because the standards were set so high for us, yeah. and that's why people wanted South grads, yeah. Because like I said, we got a DPT education and a PTA degree. Yeah. We were so overtrained and overqualified for going out into the field. That it was it was clockwork at that point. Yeah, it was so, clockwork. Yeah, everyone's so scared of Lopez. You would have to go in like on Fridays or early on Whoa. Monday through Thursday just to like <clears throat> run fake scenarios yeah. and stuff. And it was, but it was like you said, it was it became second nature. So for me, when I'd go and see Lopez's practicals or whatever, that they were, I was never scared. I was only scared like there was like a couple of things like a unix contraindications. Like right. I was always scared that maybe that would be the only thing that was going to hang me up. That's an instant fail. Right. right. That's but other than fail. that, I was like I'm completely confident. And what was so cool about Lopez too, and I don't know if this was foreign to other people who run other programs, yeah. but that whole thing. Oh, if you get below a seven, you can come back. Yeah. And you could redo it to try to get to X number. Yeah. Or no, it was if you get below, if you fail, you can come back and get a seventy. Yeah. That's how we did it. Yeah. And yeah. it was like. And, but then if you did, if you didn't do that, if you yeah. didn't, if you had to almost get like a hundred to get a seventy. Correct. You have to knock it out of the park. Yeah. And it was like, you remember going in there, and he would just have all these cutouts, and you have to take <laughs> one. It's just like, oh boy. <laughs> it was crazy. Though. It was so. It's it's funny looking back on it now, and 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 thinking about how. At least for me personally, how lucky I was that I passed. Because I'll be honest with you, I did not apply myself. You could probably tell <laughs> that I was just getting by, and yeah. which is a fault of mine, right? I should have been better. But even that, that just goes to show you how good that program was. That I could, I was, I was working my butt off, but I was not doing nearly as much work as I should have been doing, and I was still able to come out and be a competent therapist and hold a job for five years, yeah. you know, and, and feel confident in myself and be around really smart people like you, you know, it's like, it's crazy, man. Yeah, well, I, uh, you said you were lucky to pass or whatever. I, uh, right after high school, went to, to college, to undergrad, and didn't apply myself. Did the same thing you're talking about. Party way too much, had too much fun, and academic probation after the first year. Mm. Got myself to a 2.0 one I think Whoa. for the second year and transfer <laughs> but it was it was like so I barely got myself above that so I left in good standing but it was the same I just I don't think if I don't know I just didn't apply myself and so then by the time I got to where you say I was one of the smart people or whatever which is because I had almost failed myself to right that. and so that's another thing is like I've kind of picked up on things like if you got to fail Make sure you make progress. Mm -hmm. Fail, mm -hmm. fail, almost fail, fail forward. forward. And if you can fail forward, you'll get your get yourself to where you need to be. And what was what was funny too, because thank God I had people like you, you know, and because you guys pushed me, you know, because you didn't want to look stupid, yeah. and and that was the thing. You would look stupid, right? Yeah. Because it, every class you're getting called on. Yeah. Everybody, you're always getting called on, and and you could find ways to sort of <laughs> blend in, like I did. But you can you can't hide forever, yeah. you know. And it was like part of my was, yeah, especially when there's like. There's a lot of there was a lot of was it eleven? We, had 11 people. Much it was, yeah. we started with thirty. Yeah. We ended with the two classes joining together <laughs> and having eleven people. Hey, also first South graduate class to ever all of us to pass first, and I think the last. Really? I don't think they've had one since. Yeah. And bro, I tell you, I, I six oh four, six oh four, four points away from family, bro. Hey, you passed. Four point. That, that's what Lopez said, right? That's what Cascardi said. It doesn't matter if you get a six oh one, just yeah. pass. Yeah. All you need is that piece of paper. That's all you need is that piece of paper. And it was it was fun, dude, because it was like me coming from the north, that was my first college experience. Yeah. Cause so I was going through what you went you through. Were, Cause you were the you were the youngest were you the youngest one? Yeah, I was twenty I was twenty one. No, I was twenty. I was a I was an old twenty year old when I was in the program. 
Everybody else was like 25, 26, 20. Bree was the youngest, was the next youngest, and she was 24. Yeah. So I was 20, and the next closest person was 24. Yeah. And then we had people that had like already been through the army or Marines, right. and they were already back like in John. the Like yeah. John was like 33? Uh, really? 33 years old, and I was 20. Kyle, Kyle was, I don't know how old Kyle Oh yeah, Kyle, was. shout out to Kyle, came, Kyle yeah, too. He came, he came from the Marines. <laughs> yeah. And so we had people that had been through some real stuff. And yeah. So yeah, yeah, you were the you were the young pup. I was the baby, and even yeah. when I got out of school, I was so I was twenty two. Yeah. As a PTA, I, I went into my facility that I work at now. The next closest person was four years younger than me, or four years older than me. So I was twenty two. The next closest person was twenty five, turning twenty six. So I've always kind of been the baby yeah. in the field, right? Like I'm twenty six now, and I'm coming up on five years of experience in, in February. Do you, uh, being young like that and mm -hmm. being in a profession where there's a lot of, I guess, somewhat older people yeah. who may have been, did you take a lot from that? Like, did you feel like, as opposed to being, like, going to, uh, like, an undergrad or something where, like, everyone's kind of the same age? Right. What, did, what was that like, uh, being with a bunch of people? I mean, I, I, maybe you didn't even realize it when it was going on that you seemed to be younger than everyone. Well, it was, did you draw anything from people? or? It, oh, I took a light. So it's, it's pretty obvious when you're the youngest person, right? Because your mannerisms, how you talk are different, right? Because I'm, I'm speaking like a 20-year-old kid. Yeah. So I'm using all this slang terminology and, you know, I'm speaking like, like a fool just because that's what I was doing. You know, and it was like, so being around people like you and, and other people in our cohort, you guys really elevated me to, to think, okay, I need to, I need to go in that direction, right? I need to kind of get there, yeah. right? Because it's not a coincidence, because I'm not stupid, right? So it's like, I love to, and that's why I like to take a backseat too, right? Because seeing people older like yourself who would, who would step up and, and go to the board and, and tell us what we should be looking for and, and demonstrate how we should do this and, and being willing to fail forward, right? I didn't know how to do that yet, right? So number one, I was intimidated by everybody, right? Because yeah, like you would said, there's grown ass men there at that point. I'm a kid still, I'm not even a legal adult yet, right? So just kind of taking a back seat and watching how people were acting, I was like, okay, I need to get to that level, right? And then, like I said, my cohort was the reason I passed because it's, I was getting B's and A's and I wasn't even applying myself. Yeah. So I could have been a straight A student, but I was just, nah, I'll study on Sunday. Yeah. Nah, I'll get the homework done on Sunday, right? So it was like, that's why I, I would always ask you all these questions, yeah. right? Or I'd ask Candy all those yeah. questions, or Kyle, or Andrew, right? Because it was like, you guys were grown adults at that point, and you've been through the college scenario before. I've never been to college before. The yeah. South was my only college experience I ever had. Yeah, and so it's, it's, a, like, it's slightly different. Like, it's not like the one where you're like, like you bored and there's yeah, parties. Yeah. No, none of that, right? So it was so, everything was foreign to me, mm -hmm. right? So it was a huge step up in my level in, in terms of what it demanded of me. Now, I got lucky because I came from the North, mm -hmm. and you know how it is up North. The education standard is yeah. so high. So like the problem with that was though is that when I was going through my prereqs to get into the PTA program, I literally did nothing and I was straight A student. Yeah. Sure, literally 4.0 GPA and I literally didn't study one time. And that's exactly what happened to me in mm -hmm. high school and then I get to college and I'm like, ah, oh, well, you know, don't have mom or dad there. And, you know, well, I just won't go to class today. Or, you know, I'll turn it in later. And then all of a sudden it just compounds on you. It does and it happens quick, right? And then kind of similar situation, actually, it was so funny. When I first got to where I work now, again, the next closest person was three or four years older than me. So I would come in, I would come into work saying, "Oh, that's fire! Oh, that's lit!" Yeah. Or, oh, "Oh, what's up, dog?" You know, all this like all this slang terminology. It was so bad that shout out to Jesse, shout out to Jessica, shout out to Fran. They actually made a container that I had to put a dollar in every time I used a <laughs> slang word. <laughs> they made like ten to twelve words that I would use all the time. It it, it helped me. Yeah. Right, and that's what's so cool about it was that you know I'm such a student of life that I'm always looking to try to take something from somebody to help better myself. Thank God I do that because yeah. if I hadn't had that mentality, I wouldn't have made it. There's no way I would have made it. Yeah. There's no way. Yeah. And it's like, and again, you see it like in school. You know this because it's like you were there with me the whole way. Remember Gian Giovanni? Uh -huh. Yeah, he just disappeared. He didn't make it. And, and that was my guy. We went, We were in prereqs together. We had. Yeah, I remember that because we used to ask. Hey, do you know what Gio is? Giovanni? Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Like no, Gio, yeah. Never, it was like. Gone. 
So me and him, we had been through the whole arc together. We had taken English together. We had taken public speaking together, math together. Because we, we were going through it all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we were getting all of our prereqs together. So we got to the program, you're my partner, I'm your partner. And you know how it is. It's this taboo thing when it comes to like, you're my guy, I'm your guy, and we don't branch off really. It's just easier that way. It right? is, and, and I think it's actually detrimental to do it. That it is. But it is it the way is. it happens. And, you I mean, find the one person and you find a group of like three or four people. And you get comfortable, and that's just what it is. And, and it was so funny. I remember when we were in school, right? I remember we were sitting there at nighttime and, and Dr. Weaver, Dr. Cascardi, and Lopez were there that night and I was like, that's weird, yeah. right? Because we only would see, have one class a night. And they were like, yeah, so, you know, there, there's been so many people who have flunked out in the day class that what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine the two classes together and they're gonna come, to, and we were like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> we were like, so, like, none of us can go to daytime because all the nighttime people were right. working. Right. That's why we did nighttime, right? right? So. They were like, okay, so we're going to take the daytime and move into nighttime. Yeah, I think by the time we moved in, we had like five or six. You people. had five people that yeah. came into the class, or yeah. maybe even, yeah, five people. That I came. think it was Candy, me, Darren, Kyle. Darren, shouts to Darren too, my guy. And uh, Andrew, I think that was Yep, yeah. and I remember when you guys came in, I remember the nighttime class was like, I, do you remember there was that weird tension Yeah, yeah everyone was like kind of still clicking <laughs> in their own areas. <laughs> So there's this weird sort of day night tension for like a good two, three weeks yeah. and then we're finally like, this is so stupid. Yeah. And, and the teachers felt it too and they're like, guys, we can't like, yeah. guys, what are we doing here? Yeah. Like we're all like getting through this together. Yeah. And it didn't help too. We were already in our second semester. Right. So we, like you said, we all had our cliques, we all had our people. So I remember like, and we had an odd number. Once Geo dropped, yeah. we had an odd, we went from 12 to 11. So now I'm the odd person out. Yeah. And I'm like, who the hell is gonna be my partner now? So every practical, I have to. You, I, you were my partner one time. I think so. Because yeah. I, I would ask Andrew, "Hey, I need you to be my partner," or "Hey, Kyle, I need you to be my partner," or "Hey, Josh, I need you to be," because I, I lost my partner. Yeah. So everybody had their partner except for me. So I was like, "Damn." Yeah, I always tried to go early on those practicals yep. if I could. Like I, I gave it open to anybody that needed them because I knew that I could kind of fit myself on never because I didn't had a job that I was working at so I could have uh, my schedule pretty mm -hmm. funny, but I'd still get in there at the crack of dawn so that I could make sure I was yep, me too. on top of everything. But I'd always try to get in done early so that way like if you had to go and be somebody's partner, it was like just you were like, it's okay, this is easy. Like I don't I just yep. sit here. But it was always like stressful because it's like if you missed something or if somebody that was Working going, on, missed yeah. it, it was just like, oh no. And you try not to react because yeah. then you, you, you react and then the yeah. teacher looks at you like don't try to help it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was it's crazy, bro. But it's it's fun looking back on it now. You yeah, know, just because it was it was a, the best experience I ever had, but it was the hardest experience I ever had. It was tough. Yeah. That was not an easy two years of life there. No. Like it was like because for me at least, right? Like you weren't were you working at the time, no, Josh? No, I was not. So for me, yeah. Wake up at 4 a.m., go to work at Panera at 2, yeah. either go straight to school and study for four hours, or try to squeeze in the gym and then go to school. Yeah. Be at school from 6.30 to 10.30, go home, study for two hours to 12, fall asleep with my face in the book, wake up in three hours and do it all over again. Yeah. And that was like the whole entire program. I was like, oh, dude, yeah. if, I do, if I had to try to do it now, I couldn't do it. There's no way. And it's just like, it just goes to show you. When you put your feet to the fire, what you're able to accomplish, yeah. you know, because they made it hard on purpose. Yeah. They could have made that very easy, yeah. but they did it on purpose because they wanted people to fail. They wanted people to drop out because it's not for everybody. Yeah. And it's like, like we had talked about, if you don't go in there for a specific drive or a purpose yeah. or a reason, if you go into this field for money, you're not going to make it. Right. I can guarantee you that because the money should never be the sole driving factor in anything. Right. But definitely not in medicine because yeah. you can quality of care, right. the product that you present to the patient, it's just never going to be there, yeah. you know? Yeah. I had, I had gotten lucky that I had been a tech beforehand, so right. everything that we were doing, I had already experienced. So that. it was like anything that would go up. So I may have appeared that I was smart, I'm not sure if I was, I just had some, like you said, I had experience in right. it. So I just got lucky in that aspect that I was able to, you know, kind of have that, which was the hands-on learning. Not going, not necessarily. Even my undergrad, it was the hands-on I learned there, experiencing it, then going back to school again for PTA and being like, oh, this is nothing. Like, oh, I know exactly how. To do it. 
basically I know how this works. I know progressions of exercises. So I know how exercise is supposed to go. So I don't know. But this it was kind of a lucky situation, I guess. Or not lucky. I guess I kind of put myself in that lane. Absolutely, but, you did. But I was lucky that I kind of knew a lot of the stuff. Well, at the same time, though, around. you also applied yourself, though, right? Like you, like you put your head, you put your your feet to the grindstone, and you and you you worked. Yeah. You I worked during worked. the day. So I almost, once we switched to the night, I was like, I'll just go in midday and I'll stay for a couple hours, then go to class, and then I'll be done. So that way, I was able to put all my work in. Didn't have to go home and do work. I right. could just do it. I made that almost like my workplace. And, uh, and that's smart. And that's what's so cool, right? You kind of find something that works for you yeah. and you just stick to it. Like, oh my God. I don't know about you, but it's so vivid, those memories. I remember everything. I remember all those emotions of being nervous for those practicals or, or going into our path. Well, we had different path of teachers yeah. at that point because we were still day and night. But I remember, at least our path of teacher, like, that was so brutal. No, oh, yeah, so he, uh, brutal. Not even was the same one. It was not, not even give. Did he ever give you breaks? He wouldn't even give us breaks. I think he was like five minutes. He would walk out he of the room would, for five minutes and be right back. He in. would be like, "All right, we have a lot to get done tonight, so we're not going to take a break." Yeah. We go for four hours straight, and then we would go over to like eleven yeah. o'clock at night. I'm like, dude, yeah. <laughs> this is like this is too he wasn't, much. He wasn't. Uh, <laughs> I think he may have been one where uh, money may have been the factor for the reason he was oh, doing it because he was not suited to be a teacher. Tough. And I remember like hearing like through the grapevine because I know you probably heard about nighttime, nighttime when you hear about daytime, yeah. right? And it was like there was just these rumblings, like oh my god. Yeah, I don't god. think it was ever like we had never really talked to y'all. It was always like the teacher bit. Well, the nighttime class did this. Uh -huh. the daytime class did this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, it's crazy, bro. Yeah, it's crazy. But what's so? What What do you think is next? What do you think is next for you in terms uh, of in terms of therapy? I don't know. Uh, Still going to maintain my license, like I said. Um, been looking at different options, whether it be home health or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, but, you know, with PTA, like I was saying earlier, I almost feel like it's capped financially. And it's not that money is my driving force, but I want to be able to almost grow. Like, I almost feel like I've hit the ceiling. Right. And, the, and when you hit the ceiling, all of a sudden you kind of are like constrained feeling. And yeah. So I may look different fields um you know i looked at a couple banking positions and stuff like that which is completely different than what i've done before right. but so when you put that application is an interesting or uh, that resume is an interesting yeah. trying to figure out how that fits into what they're looking for when you have no experience it's all that. medical yeah and it's like yeah well you know i kind of i took payments one time so yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know i kind of know how money works or uh you know I had to fax something one time, so I can fax yeah. stuff. You know, I need that though. But normally, I try to use it as more like interpersonal stuff, like cause right. everybody like where I used to work, they they did this thing one time where they said, uh, "What do you look for in a new hire? What will be the your ideal one thing if you had to choose one thing for a new hire?" Uh, for the profession uh, we are in, I said being able to communicate interpersonal skills. Um, if you, and I could teach you everything else that you need to know, or at least show you what to do. Right. And, but if you can't communicate, one, the patient's not going to believe everything you're saying. No. Two, they're going to hate their experience. Three, you're going to probably feel a little awkward. It's going to be an awkward situation for everybody. And then the patient's not going to want to come back or the patient's mm -hmm. going to say, Hey, can I not be on that person's schedule anymore? Yep. So that's kind of what I tried to take. And when I was looking over, uh, looking at different outside of my field, well, what my field is now outside uh, at different jobs, I was like, if I can show them that I can be interpersonal, be able to communicate with people, be able to uh, carry a conversation, be able to, if somebody asks me to do something, say, oh yeah, I can do that, L let me do that. Um, everything else can be taught. And that's what I, I talked to people that had worked at, that worked at those banks and they're like, I didn't know anything going in. I may have had a business degree, but I hate, they almost want it to be blank slate because that way they can kind of train you're, you you're how they want to be. Right? Right. So, I don't know. It's still kind of up in the air. Doing Mr. Mom right now. Mr. Which I'm Mom. loving. <laughs> which I'm loving, which is great. But, you know, obviously at some point, looking to get back into the field. And that's tricky. I'm, I'm sure, you know, I'm trying to just imagine, you know, trying to put myself in your situation. And obviously it's impossible, right? Because we're in such different yeah. places, right? I don't have a kid. I don't, I don't even have a girlfriend, <laughs> let alone a well, wife. I hate one that if you're going to have a kid, we got to find someone. Yeah, that's for sure. And hopefully, hopefully that day will come yeah. one day. But, yeah. you know, it's just, man, it's, 
you know, the thing about it, what's so cool about it is, Josh, is that you are the perfect person to to navigate the things that you're going through right now. Because yeah. you've always been a very level-headed person. I've never seen you flustered, ever. Yeah. And we, we've been through it. We've, we've been, been through it. it, you know, and it's like, you've been through it. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's applaudable, you know, and it's, but it's not surprising, you know, in the sense of you being able to kind of compartmentalize the situation. And, and again, look at the positives in it, you know, and, yeah. and that's, you see a lot nowadays, it seems as though that's a lost art. You know, the ability to compartmentalize a situation yeah. and, and try to find a way to get through it and not have that woe is me mentality. Yeah. You know, that's such a toxic thing to try to carry with you. Yeah. And, you know, my question for you is, have you kind of always had that mentality? Or was there, was there some, kind of something for you, Josh, that sort of made that click for you? Um, I don't... I, I've always kind of just rolled with the flow with a lot of stuff mm. and uh, not let things get me too stressed when they probably should have. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I think that's there's positives and negatives to it. There's sure. positives that I don't get stressed by it, but there's negatives that some things should cause you some stress yeah. and make you yeah. do some more stuff. Sure. Hence the almost failing out of undergrad because right. I was like, oh, it's, it's okay, we'll figure it out. And so um, I don't know if there's anything that necessarily kicked. Maybe it just. Uh, is that I'm just such a good procrastinator that I'm just like, oh, I can just... And I've been able to, in a terrible way, been a procrastinator, but was able to still get, like, work done if I needed to. Right. And so it never stressed me out. But this is a... Not having a job is a completely different stress. Right. But, so I don't... There was nothing really that... I just, I knew, you know, I, my wife was there, and my kid, and I was like, we'll figure it out. It'll be, you know... Like you said, I think when we were talking before, and you said something, and my dad says this all the time, money will come. Figure out what you want to do. Money mm -hmm. money will follow. You'll, you'll find a way to make it work. So I, I've always kind of just felt like, even if I, uh, you know, do something you want to do, and you'll figure out a way to make it work. So, and, you know, my question for you is now, Josh, yeah. you know, kind of going towards the money, right? Because yeah. we had had a really good conversation off camera, and we uh -huh. got to try to rekindle that. Yeah. And it's like... You know, now with, with the whole money thing, right? It's I think for a lot of people, that's probably probably one of the, would would be one of the biggest hangups when it comes to your situation in yeah. particular, right? Because the uncertainty with the financial aspect uh -huh. of things. I know at least for me, that would that would be tough. You know, yeah, that would was, be tough. You know, it was different. But what did you do to navigate that? You know, it, did was there principles? Were there things that you tried to remind yourself of to not let that weigh you down? Because it, it's a constant, right? That, that, yeah. that, that's a constant battle, especially in the world we are in now, yeah. where money is power, yeah. money is potential, you know, money is influence, you know, everything somehow ties into money. Yeah. Well, like I said earlier, I was lucky enough that I knew if I needed, like if, if, if all else failed and something happened and I needed money, I, I luckily had a place I could go <laughs> and get a loan if I needed it. And so that kind of took that ease out of it. Um, but yet, yeah, so many people, like you said, just are so driven by money. And not to say that I'm not driven by money. Every, you know, there's everyone wants money and, and whatnot. But I, th I, I used to kind of think, you know, I want to make $100,000 a year. I want to make, you know, sometime I want to be a millionaire or something like that. And, you know, I still wish that would be a thing. But right, in, you know, after having been married, you know, for a little while, have a kid, Family is kind of a lot more what it makes your life, or for me at least, makes my life more enjoyable. Mm. Somebody to share time with, someone to spend time with, something, to, you know, a group of people that kind of relies on you for influence and, and you rely on them because they, they bring you a lot of joy and happiness. So yeah, money's important, but uh, for me, if you don't have, you know, you could have all the money in the world, but if you don't have somebody to share it with, what are you going to do with it? Mm. You know? It's, uh, I don't know. And you, know. you see it a lot too, right? A lot of people that I've found that are the most motivated by money have the worst life. Yeah. They might have all the money in the world, but at what cost? Yeah. You know, either drive everybody away or, you know, I don't have time to build relationships, right? right? And it's like, it's so funny too, because you hear it all the time, you know, the pursuit of happiness. Right, and for some strange reason, money has weaseled its way into that form of happiness. And we talk about this too, you know, happiness is 
is an ever-changing thing. You know, the mm -hmm. definition of happiness on a Monday might not be your definition on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday, mm -hmm. right? And like you would say, you know, shout out to my man Bernie for teaching me this. It's like when you find a passion, when you find something that fuels you internally and makes you feel like you accomplished something and gives you that feeling of self-worth that I am worth something, I am somebody, that's how you accomplish happiness. Like for me, I can only speak for myself personally. Like I haven't been ever in as good a place as I am right now because I've stopped letting the money fuel me and I've stopped worrying about the money. That was one of the most beneficial things I took from COVID, like you. I realized, listen, the money is gonna come and it's gonna go. You can't let that determine how you see a day yeah. because you worked a certain amount of hours or you made a certain amount of money. No, no. What did you accomplish in a day to make you a better human being? How did you evolve? How did you change? How did you grow today to help benefit your future? Because that, that $300 that you made on that Monday is going to be gone by the following Monday and it's like it never even happened. Mm -hmm. But maybe an experience that you took from that Monday could last you a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, it's just, it's, it's a wild thing, but it, it's such a hard thing to accomplish because like I said, there's a weird thing about there's a definition of happiness, but there is no definition of happiness. Yeah. Josh, what makes you happy doesn't make me happy, and vice versa. Yeah. I like video games. You like spending time with your daughter. Those are two very separate entities, yeah. but they'll still produce the same sort of emotions. Yeah. Right? So it's like, what would you say? What would you say to somebody, if you even can? Because uh -huh. I don't know if I could. <laughs> yeah. What would you What's say it? to somebody to help them sort of maybe feel that feeling of self-worth because you've been through it right you've been through it and, and yeah. you've, you've gone through the ebbs and flows of of maybe not being happy and not having that feeling of self-worth and not feeling that level of accomplishment and then realizing something uh -huh. right and then and then going to the other side yeah, so what i think if you're trying to find self-worth or whatever i think you got to find what a, what your passion is um for you, maybe video games, sure. you know, starting the, the, a podcast, a YouTube channel, which is awesome. It's something that I've reached out to you and said, hey man, this is great. You're doing a good job. I am proud of you of everything you're doing Same and right. uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> but if you can find something that you're passionate about, I think, and not just doing something, going to work, doing, you know, something to make money or do, you know, doing whatever. It doesn't have to be money, but just if you can find something that you're really truly passionate about, I think that can give you a lot of self worth. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you if you can just kind of keep following that dream or that passion, I don't know if that's a good answer to what you're asking. That's but, a great uh, answer. I think that finding your passions in life and following them, whether it be if it's prosperous, makes money or not, it, you know, if it doesn't make money, find something else to do. If you have to make money to do something, right. And then put your effort into the passion. Eventually, what you're passionate about, most likely you will be able to Korea, uh, make yeah. that into a career. Yes. Um, it may not be immediately, it may not be right now. But I think, and you may have to supplement it with some stuff that's right. not. You, know, you may have to take your extra few hours each day instead of going out. It may be, let me put that into my passion and build whatever you're trying to build. And eventually, the money, like I said, my father always told me like that, the money will come. So mm -hmm. if you can find your passion, follow your passion, and you'll eventually have to be I agree 100%. Yeah. I, and I think that the tricky thing about it is, is that you have to have the long-term mindset yeah. and you have to have the willingness yeah. to be able to suffer for a while yeah. in order to continue. Because when you follow a pursuit, when you follow a passion, it's never going to be understood initially yeah. because it's a personal thing to you. Yeah. And I think there's a lost art nowadays where people don't have the ability to put themselves in somebody else's shoes and understand that perspective because people lack perspective. Yeah. That's human nature. But the thing about it is, is that when you really chase a pursuit and you chase a passion, it's always going to leave a lasting impression because that is the most genuine, real form of you. And we're all given gifts. We're all given abilities that we're supposed to use to benefit the world. Right. And like you had said, when you find that passion, when you find that calling, something that speaks to you, for me, my thing is helping people. Right. That's why my YouTube channel is around people helping other people. Right. What I do for work, helping people. You know, it's like once you can find that out and you can create that drive internally between yourself and yourself, 
unstoppable. Yeah. Unstoppable. Yeah. I think people also may have a with their passion, they may be afraid to almost fail at it. Yeah. And if you you don't want to put it out there because you may think people may not like it or it may not be received the right way, which I'm sure, I mean, that may have been something that was concerning for you. Of course. You put you, every I mean, time you really on the camera, yourself, you're vulnerable. Yeah, you put yeah. yourself out there, which is another commendable thing that you just go on with it. Thank you. Um, but yeah, people are kind of afraid to fail or, you know, bills stack up and they're like, well, i got to make my money. Yeah. And so they never take the time to say, let me make X amount of money, just enough so that I can have enough, or cut, cut some spending here, cut some spending here, so I can put a little bit away, so that right. way, if I do need a little time, if it doesn't work, I have something, you know, that I can, you know, X amount of months of rent, or, you know, oh. and just kind of going, and then people, you know, jump in. I say that, I haven't done that, but <laughs> that's what I've heard. <laughs> that's what I've heard. <laughs> but no, uh, it is, I think that is a, is a thing, is, is people, are scared to fail. Absolutely. You know? And uh, it's scary. I mean, failing is a scary situation. Absolutely. I, but like we said, you got to fail forward. Yeah. And I mean, you can't grow in life without it. Yeah. You have to fail in order to move forward. You can't grow without failure. You know, failure is the best educational tool to become a better human being. Sure. Sure. You know, and I think once you realize that and you embrace it, obviously don't look for it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's going to happen. Yeah. You can't avoid it. Okay, so now that I know that, let me be open, let me be free, let me flow. And things are going to be what they're going to be regardless of how little or how much I put in. Obviously, you do have influence in things, but I really do believe that if something is going to happen to you, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you, can, can, you only can do in life, the only form of control you have is how do you react. Yeah. How do you react to a situation? That's what determines who you are as a person, right? And it's... Like it's a world man. Yeah. When you mentioned earlier about effort, if you if you put effort in, you will receive that mm. effort. Um, there's a lot of people that will just go to their job and just do like the bare minimum, and guess what? You get passed over for your promotion. So uh, you probably end up not having the greatest time at your job. But if you put in the effort to connect with people or whatever you're doing and connect, uh, it'll be seen. If you're a good worker, hard worker, money will come. It'll You'll get the promotions, you'll get the job, you'll get, you know, whatever. So yeah. it's, it's uh, effort based too. 100%. And I think uh, in a world or a, in a country now, there's a lot of people that may not, you know, just kind of thinking like, oh, maybe it should be handed to me. Mm. Handed to me. And I don't know where that came from because, you know, where it used to, where everything used to be so much people were, had to work hard mm -hmm. to just even survive yeah. and now all of a sudden you know people there's a now mindset which I, I mean I fall into too sometimes where it's who like, doesn't it happens that you know oh I think I should you know I should have gotten this because of this but you know if maybe if I just put a little more effort into it it would have for sure gotten it or something like that so I think that's another thing is people got to find be willing to put the effort in to get out the reward. It's so true. It's the only, the only way. You gotta put put something in to get something out. It's so true. Well, Josh, I'll tell you what, man. Yeah. I'm proud of you, bro. I'm, I'm proud of the man. growth, man. I'm proud of what you accomplished so far. I'm excited to see the journey. Yeah. And on that note, we're gonna close out this episode of the sit down. Thank y'all so much for watching. I appreciate it, Josh. Thank you so thank much you. for making the trip. Yeah. I appreciate it. And until next time, we will see you guys later.